system. And now I get to tell you, Leslie McDonald is the president of the Jacksonville Professional Photographers Guild. The woman knows her stuff. And she is going to help us all understand when you want to use a different lens and what are we going to get for. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you. All right. Um, this program is, well, let me start my button here so I know how much time I have. This program is normally about an hour, an hour and a half. So I've had to condense it to 35 minutes. So I've taken out a lot of fluff, okay? So if it's a little hobby jobby, that's, that's why. All right, so I posted this on the Facebook uh, page. Did you guys capture it? If not, pull out your cameras right now and do a screenshot or you can go out to the internet and get it. So this is kind of a cheat sheet. So as you can see, when you're looking at your lenses, if your lens is like 1.40, you've got a really wide lens. And as you're moving your lens up, as you're moving your lens up, you'll notice that if you get to a 5.6, you're kind of halfway there. You get to a 16, 22, 32. You're going to see how small that hole gets and how, how that lens is really coming down. And so we're going to go over that and why that's important. That's part of your aperture triangle. Next, we've got your shutter speed. So you can tell at 1 1,000th, it's pretty sharp and as you're slowing down. So like I would say if you're going to put a flash on the camera, the slowest you're going to really use, kind of, kind of hang out at 125. Um, because the back better shape, and I'm, I'm doing a whole, I'm working on an old program about uh, flashes that I'll do in two years. And then as you're slowing down, you're noticing that he's getting out of focus. And so here your, your camera, uh, your shutter speed is really slow. So here you've got that do landscapes and you're doing those waterfalls. This is kind of where you're hanging out right now where you get that really beautiful milky water. And then here we're talking about your noise or if you're shooting on film, it's your grain. So you've got your ISO or if you're on film ASA. Uh, 50, you're coming up, and most of us usually get like when we're outside 100, and then as we're coming in, we kind of hit at the 400, and then as it's getting darker and darker, we're going to start throwing our, our camera up really high. Now, if we've got one of the newer ones, just go ahead and practice it. Don't don't be afraid. Throw that thing up there. I shot a bar mitzvah at 2,500. Now it was a little rainy. But it was a really dark synagogue and I could not use a flash. So use your technology. Don't be afraid of your technology. Okay, so the, here's your cheat sheet. All right, we're going to start with focal length. So you'll hear people say, oh yeah, I've got a 7200 or I've got a 50 or I've got a 24 millimeter. What does that mean? Okay, it has absolutely nothing to do with the length of the actual lens. So here, We've got a 7200. It has nothing to do with the size of this one. What it is, the inside of the camera between the sensor and the optical center of the lens, it's this distance right here. So if you have the 50, it's going to be 50 millimeters right here. If you've got a prime lens of the prime 135, 135 millimeter, if you've got a zoom, this is going to move. So let's say we're at 70 now. If you zoom, you're going to start moving that thing out. And it's going to start moving out. So that's how it's moving. That's why you go to 100 and then 125 and 200 because you're moving that distance between your sensor and the center of your optical uh, lens, moving it out. Did you guys get that? So we understand that the millimeters, the, the 50 millimeters, has nothing to do with the size of the lens. All right. Okay. Now, and we're just covering basics before we get into the actual lenses. So like at the top, you'll see I've got a 14 millimeter, 24, 50, 200, 800 millimeter. Um, that is your range. So your wide angle are, is gonna be your 14, your 26. Normal is going to be 50. So you might've heard the term 50, 50. And the normal uh, 50 millimeter uh, lens is what, is closest to our eyes. And then you start getting into the 100 something, like 135 or something, or 200, 800, those are gonna be your telephoto lenses. So this is kind of the range. Now the, they kind of intersect. So a 35 millimeter starts to be kind of normal, but it's still kind of wide angle. And I'll explain to you why. 
This lens right, or this right here, take your camera out, take a picture of it. This is the, no, hold, hold your camera sideways. Hold, hold your camera sideways, sideways, sideways. There we go. Um, this right here is the whole basis of my program. So if you are on a full sensor camera, you're going to use the red numbers. If you're on a crop sensor camera, you're going to use the blue numbers. And, and once you understand this, just look at it. Just look at it and just remember it. Then when people start ask, saying things to you, you're going to go, oh, they're doing a landscape with a 16 millimeter. Now you'll know why, because the 16 millimeter is going to be really wide angle. Or they're going to say, oh, I have to shoot a lion or a gorilla that is really far away. I'm going to have to pull out 800 millimeter. Well, then now you know he is really far away and he's going to have to use a, a zoom lens, a high zoom lens. All right, did everyone get that? Okay. How am I doing on time? Okay, 29 minutes. All right, now. I can't tell you how important this is. The lens you use tells the story of your image and it's going to frame it. So you might hear people say things like, you use the wrong lens to shoot that. And you're going, how, how do I know that? How, how do I know? So here we are in my cul-de-sac. I'm gonna show you a series of, of pictures of this car. The car has not moved. I have not moved. The only thing that has moved is I either changed the lens or I've changed the zoom on the lens. So here we are at a 35 millimeter. Here we are at a 50 millimeter. Here we are at an 85, and at this point you can tell it's kind of dirty. Here we are at, oh, hold on, I've got the thing in. I, I want to say it's 100, I'm, this thing is blocking it, hold on. Oh, 135 millimeter. So, and at this point, you can't see what's on the other side of the cul-de-sac. You can see that it's dirty and that I have cats. It's loading, hold on. Is it because I touched it? Well, yeah, here, let me fix this for you. Um, Now, if I go here, sorry. You know, I'm not allowed to touch the black boxes underneath the TV at home either. Okay, all right, now, perfect. And here we are at 200 millimeter. The only thing that changed was the camera lens. The car stayed in the same place. I stayed in the same place. So you can see now the type of lens you use changes or frames your picture. It, tell, it tells a different story. Okay, types of lenses. We've got a zoom lens, a prime lens, and specialty lens. And Trace has brought the whole gamut of specialty lenses. So when I hand this over to him, he will be able to do um, like a little audio visual. He'll be able to look and see at it. All right, zoom versus prime. Okay, how many own more than three lenses? Okay, how many own more than five lenses? Yeah, I know, I know. Okay, so <laughs> um, you might be saying, why, why do I need all of these? Well, when you start, you get really excited and you buy everything. And then later you figure out, oh, I don't need everything because you've, you've figured out what you're going to photograph and what you're going to need. So your prime lenses are going to be the 20 millimeter, the 35, the 50, the 85, the 400. They will not zoom. That's exactly what they're going to be. So if you have your nifty 50 on, that's what it is. You're going to have to walk up or come back if you want to change the view on the inside of the, of the camera. Your zoom lenses are going to be the ones that we talked about how they, they move out and they move in. Okay, so those are gonna be your zoom lenses. And then your specialty, we'll go over that in a second. Now, if you're starting out and you don't know where to start, 
or you want to condense because you're carrying everything with you every time you go. You can just get three lenses and call it a day, okay? So you would get your 14, 24 wide angle. So you're gonna do a lot of your uh, landscape with that. You're gonna get your 24 to 70. This is gonna be your workforce. And then you're going to get your 7200. And then you get that, you pretty much are covered for most of what you want. Anything, unless you're, he's not in here. At the Christmas party, I sat next to the most wonderful gentleman who during the pandemic went into his backyard and shot, it was the moon and Milky Ways. And I, I was hoping he was gonna come tonight, but um, he will have a specialized lens and then we've got a specialized lens over there. So um, yeah, but this will cover your basics. Now, my favorite lens is the 24 to 120 because I never have to take it off my camera. Um, and um, when you're buying lenses, don't be scared to buy a lens, just buy a really good one. And if you need to sell it, you can, but just always remember the money is gonna be in the glass, okay? So, and then um, you can rent your lenses. So we're gonna go over that with, with Trey. So let's say you're at home and you've got your kid lens, you've got your 18 to 55, and that's a great place to start where you're going, well, I wanna get a little bit closer, or maybe I wanna start doing some detail shots. Rent from Trace and find out what you wanna do. And, and the rental is going to be a lot cheaper than you buying it and taking it and, and, and using it for 30 days and sending it back. And then that way you have a better idea. Well, maybe I need a better lens or maybe I need a different lens. And, and when you start looking at lenses, there are hundreds, and I'm not kidding you. There, have you seen the Canon picture with all of the lenses? There's a couple of hundred lenses there because they all have a very specific purpose. There are going to be prime lenses. They're going to be zoom lenses. And there are going to be several that, that uh, kind of go over each other. They'll cover a certain distance for different, for different reasons. Okay, wide angle lenses. So, well, first of all, let's talk about AI real quick. When I put this PowerPoint together, I told PowerPoint, um, okay, just design the look. I hadn't put any images in. It just read my text and came up with most of my slides. It's like, oh, okay. That's how smart the AI is getting. Um, all right, so let's talk about the wide angle lenses. News journalists use a 35 millimeter. So that's kind of exiting the wide angle and kind of going into the normal. And here's why. If, go back to that one slide that I showed you with, the, with all of the colors on it. If the journalist is telling a story, they want to show you that you've got a mom walking a baby in the streets of New York. So they're going to use a wide angle or a 35 millimeter because it's kind of close to your eye, not, not a lot of distortion there. Um, so they're gonna use a 35 millimeter to tell the whole story. Whereas if they only wanted to talk about the baby in the stroller, then you're gonna zoom in and you're going to use a tighter lens. You're going to use like maybe an 85 or 135 to kind of really centralize that, the story of what you're telling. But most photojournalists are going to use a 35 so that you can see the subject matter and their environment. Um, street photography, love, love this. And again, your street photographers, and this is becoming like a huge trend right now. Uh, the street photographers are telling a story of this person at this moment in this environment. Wedding venue. So you're standing at the front of the altar, no one's come yet, and you're taking a picture of everything behind the bride, and then you stand behind where all of the people are going to walk up the aisle, and you're taking a beautiful picture of everyone sitting there, um, the minister, the bride, and everything. You're going to pull out this 35 millimeter because you're going to have more room than if you're going to use your 7200, where you can, then you're just sitting here localizing your image to just this little tiny square. I'm very nervous about the time. All right, 20 minutes. All right, uh, <laughs> landscape and travel. There was a Craig. Where's Craig? All right, Craig was telling me that he does a lot of landscapes and he uses a 16 millimeter. When you look at that, that picture, you're going to see why. That way he can get the entire mountain or in the entire horizon in there. Um, low light. Okay, because of, it's a wide angle lens at like a 35 or a 16, you're, if the lens is going to give you a little bit more light than if you start going up. And, we'll, and I'll show you that to you. And it, that's kind of explained on the cheater sheet that I gave you. And night photography. 
Again, it's gonna give you more light. So when I first started shooting theater, I started with a 35 millimeter because I got the whole stage and I had all of this light. And it wasn't until I started getting a little bit better that I realized I don't need the whole stage for the whole thing. I need to actually get the after space. Then I got my 7200. Okay, normal lenses. This is gonna be your, 50, your nifty 50, your 7200. Again, this is gonna be your workhorse. So if you are a product photographer or a headshot photographer, you're gonna kind of be in this area and your 85 millimeter. Now, the thing about the 85 millimeters, when you talk to portrait photographers, they like to hang out there, but the 85 millimeter can be tricky because the, the depth of field is so shallow that you can have their eye in focus, but their ear will be out of focus. So when you have your uh, aperture really that wide open, you've got to really, uh, really work on where your focus is going to be. All right, 85 millimeter zoom lenses. Your 7200, almost probably a lot of people have that in here. Your, um, this is gonna be best for your perspective, distortion, or what we call compression. Sport lenses, how many people have seen all of the sport photographers on the sidelines with the, the giant white lenses? Okay, they're gonna have your 7200 or bigger, like this, this little monster over here that Trace is gonna send us. And your, your 200 to 700, wildlife series now that the 200 which is that one right 200 yeah 200 400 it's seven and a half pounds i mean it, yeah when i got my 7200 i i picked it up and i put it on my knife i was like oh this is kind of heavy so i went and I, I got a kettlebell and i started working on my on my uh my muscles so that i could hold this thing all day okay i if i have time to tell the story i'll tell the story later all right um, when you want to shoot the moon, you're going to get a 500, 800 with doublers. And you, I think that could do it with the. Yeah, especially yeah, starting out with the converters that add magnification. They do, they do lose lights, but there's like a 1.4x and a 2x. You can use them with certain lenses. They're very finicky. Like, what they work on, what they don't. So that's what you can see reference to doublers. Yeah, so that's the one that's going to be the most All right. Take a picture of this and we'll talk about it after the presentation. But this is a back button focus trick that I learned that a lot of the older master photographers in the guild use. And what you're doing is first you've got to program the back of your camera to do back button focus. Then you pull your lens all the way in, you focus. Or so let's say I'm going to focus on you right here. I pull my lens all the way in, I focus. So now the focus is taking up all of this space. So it's not just you, but it's, 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 it has all of this space to register. Then I back by the focus and I pull it out exactly where I want it. And then I take the picture. Okay. And that's why you want the back button focus. Cause if you have your focus on your, um, on your shutter button, then you're going to, you might refocus it. But I, I didn't believe it. I'm like, you're kidding. It really, your pictures are sharper. They really are. I went home and tested it, and then I pulled it up on the computer. They really are sharper if you do this trick. And then, um, okay, so this is perfect for Christmas. And I, I did this for another group. That's why there's Barbie there um, and the Christmas tree in the back. But again, take a picture of this. And if we have time, we'll go over this or if not, we'll talk about it at the restaurant. But this is how you're going to do your bokeh and have your Christmas lights in the back, and then you're going to light just your subject. Okay, so have you heard the term fast glass? You might say to people, what is fast glass? In a nutshell, it's, kind of, it's a lot of your primes, and it's gonna be anything under a 2.8. Now remember the cheater sheet that we showed you? So the, the 1.4, the 2.8 were way over here, and, and your aperture was really wide open. Okay, why do you want a prime lens? If I have all three of those zoom lenses, why do I want a prime lens? Okay, you're going to get more light into your prime lens. Your images are going to be sharper because it doesn't have the zoom aspect to it. They're going to spend a little bit more money on the actual optic and the lenses inside. It's going to focus faster because you're not dealing with the zoom. If you're dealing with a, a stationary lens, your optics are going to be better, better quality images, 
it's a better value. So you're not spending as much for the zoom, on this one as you would be for a Zoom. So if I got a 7,200, which I think I got mine for 2,500 or something like that. But if I were to get like a 134 uh, Prime, I wouldn't spend as much. I'd only spend like one some, uh, a thousand something. I know most of you are going, why would you spend that money for a lens? Um, it's because, because I have figured out what I want to photograph. And so once you figure out what you want to photograph, then you start putting money into that, just the lenses you need. Um, okay, they're smaller and they're lighter. So if you pick, like I said, I bought my 70 to 200 and I picked it up. I had to go home and I had to develop my, my biceps because I was carrying this thing all day. So these are going to be smaller and lighter for packing and, and carrying all day because you don't have the, the zoom and all of the other lenses attached to it. And crop with your feet. Okay, I love explaining this. Crop with your feet means that you've got your 50 millimeter right here or, or your 135 or whatever it is. You can't sit here and do that with this. It's not gonna do it. You have to actually step forward and get, compose your picture by moving around. And you might say, that just sounds like a pain in the ass. But what you do, <laughs> you've got a family and you're out, you're out photographing this family and you're standing here and you're zooming in and zooming out and then you go, okay, this is really great. But if you're cropping what you're, with your feet, I always encourage everybody to do this. You've got this beautiful family here and then you start walking around your circuit. Now I'm going to take a picture of this family here and then I'm going to walk behind them and I'm going to have them like put the baby over their head or, or between them or throw them up or something like that and get these really great images of them playing in a different area. And then I'm going to walk over here and do the whole same bit here. Now, I know you guys aren't selling albums, but if you were selling albums, I went from having four or five really good photos here to now 25 pictures. And so if you're selling them at 40 bucks a pop, all of a sudden your sales are gone. So now I've got an album just of 15 minutes of three sessions uh, with walking around. That's why walking and probably with your feet is so important because you're going to see something you hadn't seen before because you didn't force yourself to walk that session. All right, 12 minutes. Okay, I think I can do this. All right, 50 nifty. This is usually when you're just starting out, this is usually the first second lens you bought. You get one, the kid lens, and then you get this one. And this is actually a picture of mine. And um, it's a great general lens. And a lot of um, photographer professors will say, okay, I want you to start on that because you're going to see in what your eye sees and again, it's going to force you to move up to your subject or move back from your subject when you crop. Mm -hmm. It's great for portraits, groups, or landscapes. All right, the 135. So I've noticed when I started researching this, this seems to be the sweetheart right now in the professional industry. Um, there is a wedding photographer named Vanessa Joy, and she loves this lens. And she said it's because it gives me the space I need from the couple on the wedding floor. She's a magnificent wedding photographer. And so she said, they'll be on the, on the dance floor dancing and I don't have to be in their face taking pictures. So I can give them their space and still have an intimate portrait. And she says that the, because it's a cream or not a cream, it's a prime lens, her pictures are very creamy and her, her skin tones are beautiful. And she talks about how she just really loves this lens. The sharpness and compression on this lens. Um, and I have, has Kevin, has Kevin Spong here? Kevin Floyd? Okay, uh, he is my mentor. And I asked Kevin, and he said his favorite lens is the 135. And I said, why? And he goes, I never have to take it off my camera. So again, we're like that. We're gonna find something that we love and we're gonna stick to it. So right now, the darling of the professional industry right now seems to be the 125. Now, I don't actually have to get one because I have a 24 to 124. So I figure that's kind of close enough, but I'm, I'm almost on the edge of getting one. All right, specialty lenses, and we're, we're coming in close here. Um, there are three main specialty lenses. There's the tilt shift, there's the macro, and there's the fish eye. And I'm sure by now there's more. 
All right, tilt shift. Now, I know a lot of you haven't heard this. Real estate agents are going to use this. And um, what is that castle down in St. Augustine? The, the fort? Yes. So I see a lot of pictures of the fort. And, what the, and this is, would be a perfect situation to rent the tilt shift and should I photograph that fort. So you're standing on the ground photographing this fort. And what's going to happen is something called keystoning. Exactly. Your lines are going to start going up because you don't have a ladder, a 20 foot ladder to climb up on and be in the middle of the wall. You're still on the floor of the wall. So in order for it to not keystone, you have to be in the middle. Let's say you're in a building and across the street is what you need to photograph and you're in a building and you go up to the second floor and it works out fine. But maybe it's a short building and you're on the third floor. Now you're looking down, like you're not exactly in the middle, you're looking down. So now it's starting to go out this way. Again, if you had the tilt shift, it would correct that. And Trace was telling me how, and if you can't quite get it in the camera, you could go out to Lightroom and tweak it. Also, you're going to, the, okay, so the tilt shift goes this way and this way. So let's say you're doing a panorama, all right? You're at the beach and you've got this beautiful thing with a boat in the middle and then your island and then some trees. Um, so you would do the tilt shift this way. And I understand that in that situation, you would hold the lens straight and move the camera for the, the, the. You would actually do it for a parent, like, so they shift on the lens, so the lens is really straight. And you can move it all the way to the left. And then what it does is it projects that it will be on the center, then center, and then right. And unless you, you could do that by twisting the camera, too, you get those distortions. So right. So you like the shift function. And the tilt function actually changes the image coming through the lens and how it plays on the plane of the sensor. And that's when you use the tilt to fix that and then the shift or whatever. And you can also the lenses, they spin around, you can shift up and down, you can shift left and right, you can tilt up and down, you can tilt up and right. They're, they take a lot of time. Um, but yeah, so this is a really, so if you um, travel a lot and love to photograph chapels and cathedrals and things, you might think about putting this in your arsenal. All right, macros. Okay, it is, we have amazing flower photographers in, in town. Do any of you photograph flowers or insects or anything like that? Okay, perfect. So um, there are generally three types of macros. There's your 60 millimeter, and that's going to be for your artwork. If you're if you're having to duplicate, like if you're having to photograph somebody's artwork and like someone's handed you a, a picture, they say, I need to put this on my website, you would do it with a 60 millimeter. Um, and you photograph your flowers and your insects. Your 100 millimeter, you know the shots of the wedding rings on the Bible? That's what they're using right there. But the nice thing about the 100 millimeters, you can also get really pretty portraits. So yes, you could do your wedding shots and then go over here and just do little beautiful portraits, you know, kind of like headshots of the groom and the bride and everybody else. Um, and it's, 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 it, it gives you more light. So with your 60 millimeter, you're kind of right on your subject. With your 100 millimeter, you have room to bring in some light. So you can put a light on your diamond and have it sparkle. All right, your 200. This is gonna give you the most distance when working with your subject. And it's perfect if you're photographing snakes. Um, I do not like snakes. I'm only afraid of two things, snakes and needles. Um, and yeah, so uh, yeah, yeah, you have a 185. Yeah, he has a 185 macro. So again, that would be perfect for photographing snakes, but it's also going to be great for doing the, uh, the wedding rings on the Bible shot and, or portrait at your wedding. Okay, um, when you're working with your macros, you're going to want to use a tripod, especially with you with the flowers. If you're just holding it and you get it in focus, just moving it like a, a smidgen, like ever so slightly, you're going to throw that whole thing off. So you have to really use a tripod because your depth of, of um, focus is so tiny. And then uh, there's the reproduction ratio. That involves math. Um, in a nutshell, the reproduction ratio is like if you're taking a picture of a quarter, 
inside the sensor and what you're going to print out will be the same exact, exact size. So that's going to be a one to one. And then you can get them in different ratios depending on uh, what uh, different macro you have. So if you needed to photograph coins or stamps or something like that, and you needed them to be the same exact size, then you would get a macro that's on a one-to-one, -one, put it on a tripod and then photograph your object. Fish eyes. Okay. Now, the, has Keith Bartholomew spoken here? Yes. Okay. So Keith Bartholomew took that first one. He, he let me have that one. I stole this one on the internet. Um, so anyway, fish eyes, they're going to, they're going to be your widest lens. Okay. So you you're going to use them for landscape. It's perfect for using it for a situation like this, where you're at a concert or if you're photographing, um, okay. Let's say you're photographing the horizon, but you need to get more of the horizon in. there's a way to fool you. If you put the, the line of the horizon right in the middle of your fish eye, you won't have as much distortion and you won't be able to tell that you're using a fish eye. If you move the middle of your lens down more, then you're going to have all of this distortion. And people who photograph skateboarders love the fish eye. Go out and look at skateboard photography and you're going to notice these kids, okay, they're probably 35, um, they're on the floor with their cameras on a fish eye and that skateboarder is coming in so the skateboarder will be straight, but the land or, or whatever it is, the concrete or the pool or whatever it is, is distorted around. Skateboarders love the fisheye. And then they have a new 360 fisheye. When are you gonna get one of those? <laughs> um, they're, they're relatively new and relatively expensive. Okay, and we're coming in perfectly. I've got three minutes here. All right, so you're ready to spend the big bucks on a better lens. So let's talk about that. Always spend more money on your lens than your camera. Your camera only has a, a certain number of shutter clips, okay? And then, or uh, you, okay, I'm really bad. I have had my Nikon for three or four years now. I've never updated the firmware because I'm afraid that when I turn it back on, I won't know where anything is. Um, so, so, but if you are one of those that keeps updating the firmware, eventually um, you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna get rid of the camera. Your, your lenses will outlive your cameras. And especially, I know with Nikon, from 1956 on, the Nikon mount has been the same. So you can use uh, any Nikon and put it on your camera. Now the, the automatic, uh, features such as the vibration reduction or the uh, autofocus might not work. So you might have to manually focus on that one. But um, 1956 on all of the Nikon stuff is interchangeable. Now I don't know about the new mirrorless. I just, I don't, I think you need an adapter for the mirrorless. Yeah. All right, I don't know what the year is for Canon. Okay. Okay. All right, so. So how do you figure this out? You figure out what you want to focus. So this year I decided to change my business and I'm now just doing corporate headshots. So I got tired of going out in hundred degree weather and to the park and photographing seniors. Um, so <laughs> with all my gear in a wagon. Um, so yeah, so I've changed my focus. So I don't need a landscape photographer or a landscape lancer anymore. And I almost kind of don't need my 7200, but I'll keep it just in case for when I become a member and I go to go on outings with you guys. Um, so, but I just basically use my 24 to 124. I, I stick it right on 185 and I'm, I'm perfectly good with my, my corporate headshots. If you're doing landscape, then you know you, you're going to need a really good wide angle and possibly some zoom lenses if you're going to do, you know, long distance things or wildlife or something like that. So figure out what you want to photograph, what really feeds your soul, and then buy the best lenses for that. Also, don't be afraid of refurbished, okay? My first professional lens was refurbished and I was hesitant about it. And I talked to another photographer and he said, don't be afraid because when they make the lenses, everything isn't going in the factory, everything is going fine. It's exactly the way it should be. But when they're refurbished, one person is going to take it through 
from beginning to end, all of these checklists, it's going to calibrate it, going to clean it. And so now it's getting personal attention. So don't be afraid of refurbish and it will have um, a certain, usually it's like a 60 day guarantee. You can inform your, your Nikon or your Sony or your Canon directly or someone like Adorama or DNH. Okay, third party lenses. I heard a vicious rumor. And when I went to Imaging USA, I went to Sigma and I could not get this confirmed. The vicious rumor was Canon and Nikon and Sony have the capability of changing. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> um, I've got two more points that I'm done. Um, well, no, I don't, I don't want to take any tricks. All right, so anyway, I've got. Um, I'm sorry, what? Okay, so the rumor was, the rumor is that the manufacturers can change the firmware so that it won't take the third party lens. Now, I, I could not get confirmation, but there is that rumor and I've seen it. I saw it on the internet, so I know it's true. <laughs> um, <laughs> So when you do a third party, I just know that that rumor is out there. I don't know if it's true, but just be aware of that. Um, and again, don't, don't upgrade your camera on the firmware. And then cost. You always want to spend more on your lenses than anything else. And ladies, I figured out how to do this for you. You go into the garage, you find something, you put it on Facebook Marketplace, they will never notice it's gone. <laughs> Okay, and that's it, that's it. Okay, so. Um, so I have Trace here and, we're, and I want you guys to come up, come up and have your seat and we're gonna show you some different lessons that you have. Hang on, hang on. First thing is, what do you guys wanna know? There are some things that I would like to ask you a little bit. Especially that last slide about buying lenses and different manufacturers, how about the story? In general, what you said about reverse is, is very true. They're, they're generally as good or better than the new stuff. And if it's great for the manufacturer, you get a good warranty and you can do better work than you can. And I haven't had to find any such reverse. Um, Nikon, I can I, I tell you, all the berries, but I won't mention any companies such as that around, but I've got the reverse lens that literally has cigarette ashes in the front. So tell me how that happens. But when you use refurbished and new gear, as long as you buy from a reputable seller, you're going to be okay. So when you use marketplaces like KDH, use Photo Pro, they're going to stand behind it. If you don't like it, you can send it back and be totally fine with it. I will warn you about the company MPE. So they're an international seller. They sell in the States and they sell all across Europe. Um, there's nothing potentially wrong with the stuff. But you're not guaranteed to get US market equipment, which can really bite you in the butt. Is, is that gray market? Gray market, correct. So, what that means is it just wasn't packaged for sale in the US. It's the same stuff. I have lost the gray market here, knowing what I'm getting into. You're going to get the same piece of equipment. The problem's going to be if you're not going to be 750 in the gray market, you send it to Nikon, they're going to say, ah, this is sold in the Philippines, we're not going to fix it for you, which I think is just ridiculous. It's not just Nikon, Sigma, Tamron. And maybe not so much um, because after you were military, you bought yourself while you're in Japan and you came home with it. So, you know, there's, there's political stuff. So, you do want to watch out for gray market. And what you can do is you do get a piece of gear and suspect. Call Mike and say, This is my serial number. Is it gray market? It's in the US. So, back to that, and back to so how long your equipment lasts. So, say Sigma, Tamron, any other third party manufacturers. I have seen exactly what Leslie mentioned. It was an old Sigma Penny with 500. It was just such an old lens. Some of the newer, not, that was the Some of the newer cans, like the 5 BSR, they just wouldn't focus quite properly on that lens. Sigma wasn't releasing any new firmware with it. So it's just a lens that's really not going to work well with that camera. The general one just said a fortune would use the reverse equipment. And we do have a lot of people, as Leslie mentioned, that they can try stuff out before they go out and buy it. They rent, people rate for a number of reasons. Um, they can't perform, um, they're getting a second shooter, they're going on a once in a lifetime trip, 
They don't need the $2,000 lens except for that one trip. They better rent for how they are. I'm not here to be an infomercial in any way, shape, or form. This is not a huge commercial enterprise. I should say that also. I am not far lending for what's the other one? We've heard about a very small company. It's me and my wife. Thank God for all the pop I sent out a clean check for it. So I don't have to spend a whole lot of the night and stuff. A couple nights to be cleaning here. Um, like I said before, if you have questions, grab a card, it'll go through my phone number. Just call me any night question. I get questions about broke gear, about what to use for this situation all the time. I send everybody to the door, probably half the people who are no use. I do send for all our care. I will say from a serviceability standpoint, Canon wins. That's all there is. Canon will still sell you parts. Canon will let other people like yours fix your gear. Sony will somewhat. Icon won't whatsoever. I'm not a fashion icon. Um, Sigma and Tamron is the same thing. It's really hard to get parts for those. Um, talk about other manufacturers. What Leslie talked about. So, say you want a cheap wide angle lens to get into wide field aspect of photography. I'm a pretty strong proponent of these like broken on lenses. I think they're also rebadged with Sam Yang. They're sold, you know, made in Korea, sold by a reseller in New York. But for 100 to 300 bucks, you can get a nice wide aperture, wide angle lens that you don't have to worry. You know, if something happens, I'd much rather try it at this fell off the cliff than this fell off the cliff. This cost me $2,100. $300. Optically, they're pretty good. You got on some of these, like and this is the wide angle, they're available for the sole piece. So you're not going to run and go and shoot this kind of a lens. That's another thing that should be mentioned. Some of the specialties, the filter ships, they're all manual focus. Um, this specialized macro, this is a can lens, um, and what you're talking about reproduction ratio, which is said that you have a one to one ratio macro lens. Means that whatever the size of the object is, the size you can get that object projected on the sensor. So, this is a 5X, which means if you have a grain of rice, if you need to shoot a macro style with a grain of rice that has your name on it, it will make that grain of rice five times as big as it in real life on the sensor. Um, super hard to focus. You have to, you have to move the whole camera to get it to focus. So, there are things like this that take a lot of, you lose a lot of shots. Um, what questions do you have? So, for me, do you guys have any questions? Yes, sir. I have a crop sensor camera. Okay. You have to get a mirrorless with the adapter. Is the image still crop sensor on the? On you have. Okay. So I have a DX lens. Okay. Okay. But a DX lens with the adapter on mirrorless. It will probably work, but it's you're gonna you're still gonna have a DX lens. What that means is. Any lenses that are built for crop sensor exclusively, they cannot make. Think of a lens as a piece of glass that's going to project something. This is your sensor. It's just going to put an image on your sensor. Any DX, any EFS, any crop sensor, it cannot create an image circle big enough to cover that sensor. When you saw the fish, the fish eyes that have fully circular images, there's one lens here that we have, it's an 18 to, to 15 millimeter can. It is designed for full frame, but at eight millimeters, it projects a circle on the sensor. It cannot make an image big enough to cover. Because what's happening when you're normally shooting a picture? You're getting an image circle, but you're only picking up what's inside the square or rectangle of the sensor. So, yes, the, image, the lenses will still always make the same size of the circle, regardless of mirrorless and DSLR, whatever you're doing with it. But they will still work too. Not because they're a little better in that aspect, because they'll auto crop. For the, for the crop sensor, they'll put they understand that it's getting a smaller one, so it kind of smooths it up a little bit. Anything else? Okay. How long do I have? I can ramble on. Liz, time. when do you guys have to start cleaning up? Uh, quarter to double. Okay. So we do, we do need to, um, I mean, I think we're on a roll, but I was just telling Leslie, we need to clean the floors and then. Right. Okay. So, how about okay. one last thing? Okay. All right. Do you want? Okay, you've got twenty minutes to show a specialty or a fish eye or whatever you want to show. Yeah, I don't have a structure. Like, like a lot of like the lens set you spot on. The first lens people get is a fifty millimeter, one point four lens. You can get a two hundred dollar fifty millimeter. You can get a two thousand dollar fifty millimeter. There is a difference in the lens. There is a difference in the quality. A lot of your low end world cheaper lenses, like the 51.4, they have plastic internals. They're wear out. 
They won't be as accurate as focusing every time because they just have more sloppy mechanics inside them. Um, what else? The standard kit, like she said, almost every dirt driver, something I probably, it's going to be a nice wide, a 24 to 70, and then a 70 to 200. That's going to cover most everything. Oh, but I'm going on the edition, I'm going down to the cake edition, I'm going to run, I'm going on twice as soon. You will not tell us we're on the back of the um, Don't get rid of the glass, which is why it looks like. So this two plate becomes a 5.6 when it's a two plate. It basically cuts the light in half. Um, you can just trick the piece. It's really cool. I've stacked like three of these together to get like 1,800 millimeters of zoom. At that point, you have really not a good chance of holding the camera still enough to get the little box that you're getting not moving. Um, what else is there? Like you said, the reason you have this is the 180 macro, a long macro, to keep it away from the subject. You mentioned the snake bite, it's kind of funny. I had a customer this morning, there is a 24 bottle of anti map down in Gainesville. I worked at the poison center, I did a day at site. Or kids, 16 year old kids, like the rat snake, we got what we asked for. Um, and, and then these are typically the brown sports photographer or wildlife photographer. And they're wonderful, they do a great job because you've got to be rolling them all around. This one's seven and a half pounds, an older version of a two, 400 two way, it's actually 14 pounds, and it's just so big. I remember being out in Merritt Island. I'm in the car and I'm driving the wildlife trail. I could not get it literally physically past the steering wheel to get it out the window. It was too far because it was so big. I stopped the car, pushed the door, scared the bird off. <laughs> so, the practicality is good. When you're traveling, weight is a factor, cost is a factor. I did want to mention the security. I think you guys probably travel a lot with your gear. The security gear, I have so many stories of people either being robbed here being stolen. Um, Black Point Park, uh, the, the trees on the beach, we'll smash the window in a second. One of the guys at Park Festival, one of the wildlife three guy guys with like 30 grand stolen out of the car. I had a, I had a customer last weekend who was shooting a tech, tech conference down in Orlando. Guy went in and sold stuff out of his bag. So keep it with you all the time. But the other thing I started doing, I don't know that like customer's known, was going to air tag. In my bag, because if something comes around, you know, they're really determined they're going to find you rid of it. But at least you'll know immediately if something's moving the wrong direction, it should be with you. So maybe not a long time to have to make a thing. And that's another thing when you're going on vacation. I just went to the house, you know, training in Washington, D.C. last week. I wanted to take the camera, but I don't want to take a bunch of it. I took a little Sony A6400, just like you use. I took a very universal 24 or 120 lens, I think it was. Optically not the best lens, but I would much rather take one little lens and fly a lens. It just makes sense. Um, travel by airplane makes a big difference to what you can take versus going to travel by car. Sure. Yes. So you did put the part. You did want to have a sequence that you can't allow them to get What is the best path to take? Yeah. I find the most practical for like recreational travel or wildlife is a couple of things, a couple that are manufactured and they're not actually, um, oh, yes, they are and they aren't. It depends on what you want to spend. There's a lot of like 100 to 400 millimeters that work really good for a lot of, a lot of different situations. Excuse me. And then there's the third parties like Sigma. I do like their glass, I do like their gear, and I got quite a bit of it. But they make, a, they used to make a 50 to 500, now they make a 60 to 600. And like, if I was going out to Yellowstone, I actually did go through a little bit on Staten and Wind Cave, and that was like the one lens I took because I knew I could shoot almost everything without taking it off the camera in a dusty environment. Kind of dusty environment, not having to change a lot. So I would think, yeah, I did on a certain trip. I took one of these rubber models, I ended up in a star trail one night, the wide angle, I took photography, and a 50, it was a 50 to 500 in that case. And those lenses, you can get different weights and different versions. When you pay for it, you're always paying more to get lower light lenses and higher quality lenses. But I would say they start around 800 bucks, they go up to about $2,000. Um, they're just very universal and you get the most range. You don't get the best end, you don't get the super low, low light capabilities, but most times you get the stuff in broad daylight, you know, pretty well spent to get the price of the So there, there was a range of them. There are Canon makes 100 to 400. We're both the now and the mirrorless now. 
Zyphon uh, has a new, I think they have 100 to 400 for their city amount. We're always supposed to those like $2,800. Um, so that's what I start with this third party stuff. Yeah. Can you explain to the person who can receive the second earlier about the mirror standards with the act of yes. uh, using your existing lenders? That's a big deal. That is a big deal. Um, okay, so what I was talking about is, you, okay, Sony's are, well, I almost say they're always there. Pretty much all the new canvases like are mirrors. Um, if you don't know much about them, I highly encourage you to move to them, at least within the next 10 years. Um, but you get better focusing, the camera buys is a little smaller, but you don't want to waste what you've already spent on lenses or you want more versatility. So they, they don't generally come with it. Some do, depends on how you buy them and adapter. And the, the adapter means on Canon, you can take the RF mount and I can mount PF, or I can mount VFS to crop system lenses on Nikon. The new, the new mount's called the Z mount, and I can mount ZX and FX lenses on that. Sony, they actually do have a mount adapter for the old alpha mount, but everything's called a P mount. But okay, so what they enable you to do is basically use any, any old lens that you've been using on your current camera system on the new mirrorless camera. And the adapters do not have glass in them, which means they don't change the amount of light getting to the sensor. They don't change the f stop of the lens. They're literally a mechanical and electromechanical conversion to let that lens work on your camera. I've seen no problems with the Nikon or the Canon using Nikon and Nikon or Canon on Canon. I have, I attend the test when customers print, they told me they've got an EOS R and they're going to print a camera on 500 600 for PF out. I'll go and test that one because there is a chance that it just works wonky. I don't even know how to explain it. I've seen focus hunting where the camera just can't get a focus point and, and you can sometimes fix that with the firmware, some of the newer third party signal camera ones that you can update the firmware on that. And, and don't be really scared about getting the firmware on your camera. I know you mentioned that. You're not going to get a bunch of different video options or things like that usually. Well, um, I mean, look at how many times Photoshop has changed. There is one, one caveat that was updating the firmware on your camera. If you guys don't know what I'm talking about, if you look through your menus, you're going to see somewhere in there firmware updating. If you're on manual mode, if you're on P mode or, or A mode, or, you may not see that. So what you do is you download a little piece of software from, from the manufacturer's website, you put it on a memory card, you put that in the camera and say, hit firmware update. Don't ever do it with a less than fully full battery. And once you click OK, don't breathe on the camera. Don't touch it, don't go near it, wait till it says it's done. Um, I've had only again, icons fail in the middle of it. They can literally turn the camera into just a brick. Literally, the software is in this half burnt state. I call George. George usually works a miracle and somehow gets it back, back to life. But in general, I do it all the time. Lots of times, it's really minor fixes in the firmware update. But with some of the newer mirrorless stuff, they actually are enabling, especially back on really upgrade the auto focus between the versions of the firmware. So if you're scared to do it yourself, get George or myself to do it whenever you bring it here in the input. It's, it's not a big deal unless something goes wrong, and then it's a big, big, big deal. Have I answered your question well about the mounts? Those adapters usually cost between 100 and 200 bucks. Sometimes they come with a kit, you'll see them, especially with the lower end, they'll come, they'll come with that. When they first came out, they'll come with that. And you can actually get cool stuff with some of the mount adapters. Some of them have drop in filters, so you can put a circular polarizer. This lens has a drop in filter, which means they literally can put a filter and drop it in like that here on the end. You can't afford to put this inside, so that is. Um, one's got a control ring so you can change your ISO on demand just by spinning it. So you can do some pretty neat stuff with those mounts and Don't be scared of it. Scared of it. Can we put a fisheye on a camera? A body? Yeah. Here. I'll show you what this is. I think it's kind of hard to see that. Take a small one. So, what we're doing is I got a fire mark for you. There you go. I got a 5D mark for here, which is a full rate cannon. And this is the 850 millimeter fish eye. And this is the fish eye from the white lenses. They have this spherical front element, which does not work well with filters, but they have special filters. So, um, so let's turn this one on. I'll let that on there. 
We have great stand up so long as we can. That's it for the day. So well, I'm gonna pass this around and let you guys play with it. Okay, so right now you it's hard to see because it's not very bright. I'm gonna pass it around. It's filling the sensor. So when I spin it this way to eight millimeters, see how that image gets all circular on side, you can't fill the sensor. So I'll pass this around. Feel free to spin the zoom. If this image goes away, it's using live view. Just hit that button in live view. Do any of you have that firmware? Have what on? Firmware. They all do have firmware, but not necessarily firmware that I can even access it around the day. The ones that I've seen are Tamron and Sigma. You buy a little dock, and then Sigma has a nice little program that lets you update the firmware on all their art series or contemporary series ones, and some of the newer Tamron ones. But the, generally, the firmware has been restricted to like manufacturer only. I don't even think George updates the firmware like on the cans. <coughs> Some of them are actually the well, camera bodies. The same thing out to the Olympus systems that I shoot. Mm -hmm. you, you update the firmware and the, on the heart on the body and blends together. Right. So because they talk to and, and that is more common. I think I don't know about the R. I think the R now and the Z you can do it through the camera body. Nigron also think, has a thing on their camera bodies called lens distortion. It's like the lens database that has lens correction features that you can update directly on the camera body with your firmware. And it's updated in the same way. So they have a test that really set over five minutes. Um, would it be a good idea if y'all want to have a Could I have a drum roll, please? Thank you. Yay. Thank you all for participating in tonight's People's Choice competition. This time we had seven wonderful entries, and I should read their names so you know who they are. Ted Floor, do I pronounce it correctly? Um, Heather Owen, Max Schmura, Silas Osborne, Anita Fanick, Mary Ann Huddleston, and Sharon Bivens. The voting was very, very close, and these are the winners. In first place, we have Mary Ann with Crashing Surf. That's number one. Oh, excuse me. No, no, no. First place. It's number six. And Ted's Beach Splash Zone, which is number one, is our second place winner. And our third place winner is number seven, Sharon Vivin. Yeah. If the three of you could please come over here and have your picture taken, and then please come see the lenses. Thank you again. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>